Well, folks, it's finally happened. At the time of recording, the British monarch Elizabeth II has died after being on the throne for over 70 years, the longest reigning monarch in British history. Overseeing seven popes, 14 American presidents, and 15 British prime ministers, from Winston Churchill to Liz Truss. Talk about a fall from grace. For every British person, Elizabeth was always a constant presence, from the annual speeches every Christmas to featuring on all of the currency. To imagine the UK without its Queen is a very difficult task indeed. But if you're not British, then you're probably thinking, why should I care? And what a ridiculously ignorant question. You should care, because the death of this monarch is far more significant than what originally meets the eye. She was, inarguably, the most famous person in the world at the time of her death, and her death is much more than just the death of a human being, but a symbolic death of the very concept of the United Kingdom itself. Truth be told, the British people have always been quite divided when it comes to the monarchy. On the one hand, you have the Royalists, who, as their name implies, support the royal family's continued existence as an institution. Whereas on the other hand, you have the Republicans. Not them Republicans, real Republicans, aka people who want the monarchy abolished. This divide, however, has never been an equal one. There's always been more Royalists than Republicans, by, if I had to pull an estimation out my ass, around a 2 to 1 ratio. Hence why the Royal Family is still, well, Royal. There simply isn't much of a demand to change, as there's always more pressing issues to attend to, such as healthcare or crime. And as such, when it comes to the monarchy's continued existence, hardly anyone really cares. Of course, however, there are always exceptions. There are some very unusual people who worship the royal family as if they're the second coming, and there are also others who are so tasteless and hateful towards them that it genuinely makes me feel repulsed at their sheer lack of class. But both of these, however, are considered to be pretty fringe, and pretty cringe. So at this point you're probably wondering, what am I? Personally, I've never been a fan of the concept of monarchy, for one very simple reason, meritocracy. In this life, when we are born, we are all given a hand. Some people are born poor, whereas others are born rich. Some people are born ill, whereas others are born healthy. Some people have great parents, whereas others have none at all. For each one of us, our early life is entirely beyond our control, and all we can do is simply try our best with the hand that we've been given. The amount of people I have known personally who are talented, gifted, and eloquent, yet are ultimately limited by their lack of funds, connections, and opportunities is unbelievable. And at the same time, the amount of people who are rewarded and celebrated in spite of their lack of talents, simply for being born into the right family, is equally sickening. I think almost everyone watching this would agree that this life is not fair, and it never has been. And to me, monarchy is the ultimate representation of such an injustice. The overt and whimsical celebration of unearned privilege. And I don't mean privilege in the moronic progressive sense, whereby such fools attempt to split up demographics via some sort of perverted blame game. No, I mean real privilege. The idea that just because a person was born into a certain family, that they should receive titles, palaces, diplomatic immunity, and more, all paid for by you and other taxpayers, the vast majority of which are poorer thereof, is an idea so twisted that only a cult would celebrate it. And that ultimately is what all royal families are, a cult. The way that people go out of their way to watch their weddings, follow their news, and obsess about their family tree, when, in most cases, their own family is in complete disarray, is a psychological phenomenon so bizarre that I can't believe it hasn't been studied more. The truth, dear viewer, is that there is no difference between you and a king. You are both bone, blood, and flesh. You both breathe the same air, and ultimately will both answer to the same god. There's nothing wrong with hierarchies. All societies must have people at the top to be admired and celebrated, as well as people at the bottom to be mocked and humiliated. 
but a person's position in society should never be determined by what they are. Their bloodline, their bank account, their connections, but who they are. Their talents, their values, their willpower. Meritocracy is the idea that no matter how foul of a hand you've been given, that you should be able to take advantage of the skills you have to the best of your ability, which is in the best interest of not just each and every individual, but also the nation as a collective. Monarchy symbolises everything that goes against meritocracy. In Britain, the head of state, the highest position in the land, is the monarch. This means that no mere man can ever, under any circumstance, reach that role within the confines of the pre-existing system. And that is simply unacceptable. Kings used to ride out in battle with the troops to defend their lands. Today, they sit on their arse and eat carrot cake. I mean, I'm not opposed to the idea of a monarch, so long as they were absolute and non-inherited, that is. But a constitutional monarch? Pointless. And don't give me that argument of, they generate lots of tourism. People don't visit the UK to see the royal family. They visit the UK to see the UK. France is the most visited nation in the world, and they're doing quite well without a monarchy to prop it up. And thus, due to my loathing of the monarchy, many years ago in 2016, I thought long and hard about how they could be democratically dethroned, which concluded in a concept known as Operation Octopus. The idea was simple. Imagine you're underwater, and you're in a battle with an octopus. The octopus is most vulnerable at its head, but if you try to strike it there, it will defend itself using its tentacles. Thus, to attack the head, you must erode its tentacles first, until only the head remains. Being a British Republican was always going to be a fruitless endeavour, because the British monarch is not just the British monarch, but the Canadian, Australian and New Zealand monarch, as well as many other places, as well. In this metaphor, think of the British monarchy as the head, and the Commonwealth nations as the tentacles. In order for the British monarchy to cease being such, the Commonwealth nations must first become republics themselves, which would leave the head vulnerable. But even then, it wasn't that simple. Because the octopus had a guardian that prevented all damage towards it, and that guardian was Queen Elizabeth II. No Republican movement would ever gain any ground, because Elizabeth's popularity was simply so vast, partially due to the unbelievable length of her reign. But with her death, the octopus no longer has its guardian, and it is inevitable now that the Commonwealth nations will seek republicanism, and thus ultimately, the British monarchy itself will disband in the coming decades. Naturally, one of the big downsides of Operation Octopus is that the royal link that unites the British diaspora will be broken, and as someone who strongly believes that all Kansuk nations should be united as one, such would be a most brutal blow, but unfortunately, a seemingly inevitable one. Now, why am I so certain that the monarchy is on borrowed time now? Well, it's simple. Because most of the royal family are, to put it bluntly, decadents. Charles will always be known as the guy who left Diana for Camilla, and let's face it, no one likes Camilla. Prince Harry is now universally recognised as Prince Cuckold, ever since being tamed by his annoying wife, often seen giving speeches to empty rooms, usually about one, social privilege, despite the fact that he's, you know, a prince. Two, how much he hates Britain, despite the fact this country is the only reason he's even slightly relevant. And three, climate change, despite the fact that he probably has one of the largest carbon footprints in the whole world. What I think about global warming is that it's really good because it uh, warms up the world and it gives us all tans and it makes us very hot and everything and everything. Exactly. And Prince Andrew, well, he's a paedophile. I mean, it's not looking good, is it? The only mildly normal members of the royal family are William and Kate, but considering Charles has waited over 70 years to get his ass on that throne, I don't see him abdicating anytime soon. So essentially, they're doomed. Though insignificant in day-to-day -day life, the monarchy serves as a symbolic wax that glues the UK together by giving the nation a solid identity with a millennia of history attached to it. It is, essentially, the establishment. 
and to get rid of it will almost certainly give the UK an identity crisis, which naturally presents an opportunity for transformation. The question is, however, who will be able to seize such an opportunity? All Western nations since neoliberalism became the status quo ideology have been in a state of crisis. A crisis caused completely by our wealthy out-of-touch elite forcing the unholy combination of social progressivism and economic conservatism onto everyone else. But because the UK never underwent a monumental event that brought the nation into the modern era, such as the French with their revolution, or the Germans with their reunification, the effects of neoliberalism have hit the much more class-based nation more profoundly than anywhere else. The UK is a nation that allows thousands of its own children to live in abject poverty. A nation who sold out its youth by allowing investors to buy up all its houses. A nation whose politicians party while the people they swore to serve die. A nation where nothing is sacred and everything is for sale. A nation simply in decline. The status quo Labour and Conservative Party, who have ruled for centuries, are both almost universally despised and accurately viewed as borderline identical in beliefs. Neoliberal, and thus complicit in said decline. And this frustration with the two main parties being so useless has led to the rise of numerous political factions rising amongst Britain's youth. First, you have the far left, humorously referred to as the woke, who are essentially just a bunch of racist and sexist godless decadents who seem to be under the illusion that they're some sort of communist revolutionaries, despite the fact that they're in bed with practically every major corporation on the planet. They're typically, ironically enough, from middle or upper class families themselves, and thus extremely naive. Hence, why neoliberals love to use them like the useful idiots they are in pushing their agendas forward. Second, you have the far right, who have completely sacrificed all social conservative values and now focus exclusively on economics instead. Constantly jabbering on about low taxes, small government and red tape, as if they're some sort of American who took a wrong turn. And lastly, those to whom I belong, in the centre. The socially conservative and economically socialist. Universalists in nature, who wish to have a strong state that accelerates the return of social order, dominating corporations into submission, and maximising the quality of life for all its citizens as a pragmatic collective. Despite being radically different, all three of these factions have one thing in common. They are all Republican in nature. The far left are Republicans because they hate Britain for once being an empire, and thus wish to trash its history as much as possible. The far right are Republicans because, as you may expect, they simply don't want to pay for them. And in the centre, we are Republicans for the reasons listed earlier. The lack of meritocracy. Now that Operation Octopus is truly underway, the UK will engage in a civilian culture war the likes of which hasn't been seen in centuries, to decide the future of the nation. Essentially, the country is going to become somewhat of a free-for-all. The British monarchy held things together, but if it went away, then everything's up for grabs. If the far-left false progressives and their corporate masters manage to hoodwink the electorate, or God forbid, Britain enters an era of unrivalled far-right tribalism, then I cannot even imagine what a horrific disgrace awaits Britain and its people in the future. If, however, those of us in the centre manage to form an unbreakable coalition with the electorate, then Britain will certainly cure itself of its neoliberal plague, and stand as a proud testament for the rest of the world to follow. The bottom line is, however, that the death of Elizabeth Windsor will be looked back on in history as a turning point for Britain. It doesn't really matter what the monarchy tries to do now, whether they embrace the far-left wokeness or try to steer the storm against it. Their purpose is no longer accepted. And thus begins a transformation. A transformation from the monarchy it has been for centuries into something else. And it's because of this radical transformation, out of any nation in the Western world, that the UK specifically has an unrivaled opportunity to light the match against neoliberalism far more than any other. All eyes should be on Britain in the coming years and decades, as this country is going to radically transform for better or worse.
Right, folks, I hope you enjoyed that. And I very much want to know with this one, do you think that my forecasts for Britain becoming a republic are accurate? And do you think it will have as much of an effect on the country as I think it does? Because I think that if Britain became a republic, it would essentially enter an identity crisis. It wouldn't know what it is anymore. And a nation that doesn't know what it is anymore is a nation that is up for grabs, essentially. I think people really underestimate just how difficult the next few decades are going to be, not just in Britain, but across the Western world, in the 30s, the 40s, the 50s. Honestly, as depressing as it sounds, we are entering war times. Not war as in world war, a different type of war. It, it's, it's political factions, it's wars within the nation. It's, an, it's, a, it's, an, it's a global war, in a way, between different political factions. And in this case, the British monarchy is just uh, almost like a sideshow to that. But either way, folks, I'll see you next time.